good morning, Discover Fellowship Church. How are you? Everybody stand, greet somebody around you, say hello, give them a hug. John, I just cover for Stephen today. Um, thank you for staying. <laughs> and uh, so usually what we do is we read scripture um, before the next song. But the song we're going to do is called "He Touched Me." And there's a line in there. It's like uh, when Jesus touches me, with it, this, this changes my whole life, right? So as I was going through scripture, there's so many pieces of scripture that that talk about when you are touched by the hand of Jesus, what happens to you. And I go back to the the year I would say, which I was. I was 43 years old in 2010, and uh, when Jesus touched me, my life was never the same. So, <laughs> and so that's, that's the best way I could describe it, actually saying this today, and so we're going to do this song, so I'm sure you guys know it. Sing along with me.
and everyone will stay well during this time. But uh, we also want to go to the Lord in prayer in, the, in our prayer time this morning. Uh, three things I'd like for you to pray for. One is continue to pray for the building process. Uh, if you saw it uh, online, uh, we did have uh, the floor poured. Uh, I don't know, did we show a video this morning of that? Yeah, y'all saw the video. So amen. And uh, so they should start laying the steel out this week and and as soon as the uh, compression test comes back that the the concrete uh, meets the the load requirements then they should start putting up the steel here in the next week or so so it's going to really begin to to take off and uh, part of that building process is just pray as our as our construction loan as they're reevaluating where we're at and what we've raised and all of that and to make sure that uh, hopefully they can, they'll go ahead and give us the green light on that um, but uh, you know God has provided in so so many ways through this whole process which uh, is truly a God thing so I want to pray for that and then also we got between 55 and 60 of our folk are away this morning over at Lake Yale for winter camp and uh, so uh, Pastor Patrick and Pastor Stephen is over there, uh, you know, helping with the music and all the sound. Our, our Hispanic uh, praise team from our Hispanic church is leading the music this weekend uh, for that, and they've got some of their youth win as well. And uh, so it's just a just a big big camp uh, for our kids. And so just pray that uh, that some major decisions will be made. A number of kids went that are not saved and uh, it's a great great opportunity to get them away from everything else and hopefully our prayers that the Holy Spirit will speak today and uh, draw them to Christ and then another thing that we want you to really be prayed about 
is who's your one? You know, we mentioned that a few years ago. But, you know, as I challenge you at the beginning of the year, you know, try to share Jesus at least once every week, at least somehow, some way. I know I was able to do it in the elevator this week. Uh, you know, the lady asked, said, are you going down? I said just this time I'm looking forward to going up one day to be with my Lord how about you Amen. it's just a simple word I mean I didn't pull out Romans 323 and all of that see conversations can be simple we don't we make them I think we try to make it too hard and so I, I would encourage you to, to be looking for opportunities and then when God gives you one don't be afraid to throw the line out there and, uh, you know, it, it made her think. <laughs> so, you know, but it, it was a good thing. It was a good, good conversation. And uh, she even told me, have a blessed day. And I said, I'm going to. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have one. So who's the person that you really want to see come to know Jesus this year? I mean, I've got several. But I'm still praying for my old neighbor. And... Uh, as you pray, if you would pray for me and Jim, I just, uh, I was able to swing through the old neighborhood a couple of weeks ago and got to see him and got to still love on him. And uh, so just, I'm still not giving up on Jim that he'll come to know Jesus. And uh, so there's going to be an opportunity here soon. We're going to have him over to the house. And once I get him there, he's, you know, he's like fish in a barrel. I mean... <laughs> He's either going to get saved or he's not going to get to eat. That's about what, no, I'm not going to do that. But uh, just pray that uh, the Lord will give us an opportunity to be able to reach that man for Jesus. So take a moment now. Let's, you know, gather up with folks around you if you feel comfortable doing that. If uh, at least with your spouse or friend or whoever you're sitting near. And uh, let's just take a couple of minutes and pray for each of these this morning. Father God, as we continue to pray, we do lift up that one that we want to see come to know you. Ralph, Megan, Irene, 
the Swetland family or Sam or Marissa or Hunter or Summer, that, that somebody's one. And Lord, you know who our one is. You know who my several ones are that I want to see come into a personal relationship with you. So Lord, we pray that you would allow us to to get outside of our comfort zone and be willing to, to in some way engage somebody this week in talking about eternity, talking about the fact that they need to, to have that settled. But Father God, also, we just thank you for the, the great crowd that's over at uh, camp this weekend. And Lord, I lift Reed up to you as he is the... the the key speaker and for Patrick as he also is speaking and that you would just Holy Spirit move in a mighty way there or there's a couple of those students that right now you know who they are they're on my heart and and I'm praying that that this will be the weekend that their life is changed that they come to know you as their Lord and Savior Father, I pray that you would make it so clear, the, the presentation, that, that they, they won't have any confusion. There won't be any, you know, wanting to delay. But there'll be an urgency placed on them to come to know you as their Savior. And Father God, also, we thank you for the progress that's been made on the property Thank you for the great year we had last year. And, and as we continue to move forward with our transformation as Discover Fellowship, that, that you would just bless in this whole process, Lord. Uh, you know the funds that are needed, and uh, you know how you want to provide them, and we're just trusting you for that. But thank you for Brother Paul as he oversees this for us. and. Just pray for him as he balances his time here with, with Christine as she continues to finish up her treatments. And we just pray that, uh, that you would just strengthen her this weekend. And uh, just pray that she get those other two treatments behind her as scheduled. But Lord, you know the many that are home that are just fighting these colds and viruses and the flu and some recovering from surgery we just lift them up to you today that you would just give them a great day Lord just take the sickness away the soreness away that they may be well soon we just again want to say thank you that we can just come to your table today and just reflect on the wonderful gift that you are to us we ask it in Jesus name Amen Would you please stand?
it someday for a crown to the old rugged cross I will ever be true it's shame and reproach gladly bear second and here so much for the blessings that you give us that we want to pray for this church lord pray for pastor randy that we would have our open minds and open hearts to hear his message today lord pray for the building process that's going on out there lord all the workers touch their hands and bless all these people and and the youth ministry that's happening right now lord may may you bring these unsaved kids that are that you bring them toward you lord we love you we praise you we pray this in jesus name amen If you would, turn with me to Revelation chapter 3 this morning. Revelation chapter 3. Uh, we're uh, just taking a, a week's break in our Discover series. Got a couple of more weeks that we want to be doing that. Uh, but uh, this morning in our 11 o'clock gathering, uh, we have deacon ordination. Uh, we're going to be ordaining uh, Sean Dolly and Joel Idris and Lenny Rodriguez. Uh, into our deacon ministry and uh, so I, I didn't want to get out of sync and, and uh, I thought what better way for the other two gatherings to come than to, to take time at the table and to uh, have the Lord's Supper and uh, so that's what we're going to do this morning but before we come to the table uh, we're going to look at three suppers that are found in Revelation. There's actually three meals that are mentioned here. Now, there's a lot of meals mentioned in the New Testament, in the Gospels. Uh, you know, you remember one time when Jesus was there in Jericho. You know, he saw Zacchaeus, and he told Zacchaeus to get out of that sycamore tree, come on down. And that he was going to his house, and he was going to have have a meal with him. And you remember how all the Pharisees and the religious leaders they got all bent out of shape over that, because in that culture, you just didn't sit down at the table with anybody. If you, you know, sat at a table, it was the n next most personal thing you could do. You know, to marriage. I mean, you just didn't do that. You just didn't eat with anyone and everyone. And so, you know, they got bent out of shape because they knew Zacchaeus was not a Christian. He wasn't a follower of Christ at this point. But also, we, we see other meals. I mean, over in, in Mark chapter 6, Herod was having a banquet. 
and it was a you know a big celebration for his birthday <laughs> and uh, one of the dancers danced so well they said what would you like I'll give you anything you want and that lady's mother said ask for the head of John the Baptist and so that's how John the Baptist lost his head was because of a dance at a birthday party then in Luke chapter 14 Jesus talks about how there was a, a homeowner a plantation owner had a farm whatever and uh, he wanted to throw a great feast and he invited all of his friends and folks that he knew there in town but so many of them had excuses they were too busy to come and so what did the what did the homeowner do he told his servants go out to the highways to the hedges go out to to you know go into town go down the alleys go knock on doors and invite anyone and everyone you see to come to my house didn't have to have an engraved invitation didn't even have to know the owner they were invited to come I mean that's one of the meals that we see and then one of my favorite meals that we see in the Bible is found there in John 12 when Jesus goes to Bethany and he's at the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha and and while they're preparing to eat Mary goes and gets a very expensive bottle of perfume and she breaks the seal she breaks it open and she pours it out on the feet of Jesus and then wipes his feet with her hair you remember that story you know Lazarus I mean not Lazarus excuse me Judas went crazy <laughs> I mean he he just he lost it why because when he saw that that perfume being poured out all he could think about is how much it was worth <laughs> and how that they had she'd have just given that to the Lord then he could have given it to Judas and Judas could have sold it and and I'm sure he would have taken his 20% commission off the sale of that because he wasn't always on the up and up as we well know but then all the gospels talk about one special meal and that was when they all gathered there for the Passover in Jerusalem that last time and it was that night that Jesus took the Passover to a new level when he introduced them to the concept of, of what his death would represent when he talked about the bread and the cup. And it, and it was also at that table that night that Satan entered Judas. And he left to go and prepare to betray our Lord. You see, those are many of the meals that we see and. <laughs> You know, I think we took sort of a hint from that because we sure do like to eat around here, don't we? Because there's nothing better as far as fellowship than doing that. But I, I want us to look at three suppers before we come to the table for a remembrance time. I want us to look at three different suppers that are mentioned here for us in Revelation. And the first one is found here in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. It says, See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. This is what we call the Supper of Salvation. Now, whenever we think about Revelation, we usually think, well, this has to do with the end times. It has to do with, you know, what's taking place in heaven. But you need to realize this supper doesn't take place in heaven. Also, this supper is not held on one day at one time. The supper of salvation happens all the time at different times. And it's not a, a meal that's held where, you know, usually hundreds or thousands are going to show up at the very same moment. It is a very personal time where Jesus is giving you the invitation to come to know him as your Lord and Savior. I mean, this is a passage that we use a lot when we do share Christ with someone. 
Uh, I mean, I, I grew up on the Roman road. That's what I cut my teeth on. And I remember being taught that when, even before I was, you know, in middle school. But Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Which means we, we all enter this world lost. I mean, because how many is all? All. <laughs> everybody. It's everybody. So we've all sinned. Whether we want to acknowledge it or not, we're all sin. We, uh, we came into this world as a sinner. But then Romans 6, 23 says this. It says, for the wages of sin is death. That's the first half of the verse. And usually I would pause there. If, I'm, if I have the opportunity to share this in detail with somebody, I would stop after for the wages of sin is death, and I would say, but look at Romans 5, 8. It says, but God commendeth, or God showed his love to us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And, and because he chose to die for us while we were still sinners, then we can go back to Romans 6, 23, to the second half of the verse, where it says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, how do you get that gift? Well, I'm glad you asked, Romans 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And sometimes people will hesitate, and they may not be willing to do it right then. They say, well, I think I'll wait. I think I'll just, you know, let me think about that. And that's when we then take them to this verse in Revelation. Say, look what Revelation says. Right now, Jesus is knocking at your heart's door. He's knocking at your heart's door. And he wants to come in. He wants to have fellowship with you. He wants to do the most intimate thing he can outside of the marriage, and that is sit down with you and get to know you. I remember when I was very young, my dad, as I've told you, he worked part-time at the funeral home, and and uh, one night we had gone up there to pick him up, and, and I went in to get him. And, and while I was waiting on him to finish something with a family that he was talking with, I noticed this picture. It was hanging on the wall there in the funeral home. And I was just looking at it, and, I, you know, it's the first time I'd ever seen it. And, and I thought, hmm. And, and one of the other employees came up to me and said, do you notice something different about that picture? And, and I, I just looked and I looked and I said, well, ah, no, not really. What, what, what are you talking about? Uh, they said, where's the door handle? And every time an artist has tried to recreate this painting, you'll never see a door handle on the outside. And the reason for that is this. The artist understood Revelation 3.20. That Jesus will never force himself into your life. I mean, does he want to come in? Absolutely. That's why he went to the cross. That's why he died for us. I mean, he didn't do it in vain. He doesn't want it to be in vain. And, and he wants to come in. But here's the thing. He wants it to be of our own free will. He wants you to freely recognize your need for him and that you would open your heart and your life up to him. So therefore, you have to open it from the inside for him to come in. Now, here's the thing. This is the first supper. It's the most important supper of all eternity because this, whether you come to this supper or not determines whether or not you're going to spend eternity with him. I mean, if you don't come to the supper of salvation, you're not going to get to enjoy the next supper. I mean, this is the prerequisite for everything. And, and, but it's not just a supper. When we talk about it, it's a supper of salvation. It, it, it comes with several elements. One, it comes with a, a wonderful cleansing. He will wash you as white as snow. I mean, Isaiah 118 says, come let us reason. I like that old translation. It says, come let us reason. Or, or you know, the new says, come let's settle this says the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are crimson red, they will be like wool. 
In other words, when you come to Jesus, it doesn't matter what you've done. He's going to wipe it away. And you may be sitting here today and you say, well, preacher, you don't realize what I've done. You don't even know what I've done this week. There's no way he could forgive me of that. There is absolutely nothing that you can do that hasn't already been covered by the blood of Jesus. He washed it. I mean, forgiveness was done 2,000 years ago. That's when the price was paid. What's left now is for you to receive what he's already done. And, and so the supper of salvation gives us our cleansing. The supper of our salvation gives us rest. Rest. He says in Matthew 11, 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I mean, we, we live in a time that we're, we get tired, don't we? <laughs> People all the time say, man, how you know? I'm just tired. Or, or some of y'all say, man, Pastor. They say, how are you? I say, I'm, I'm well. I say, well, you look tired. <laughs> I may not feel, I wasn't feeling tired, but all of a sudden, I thought, oh, I guess I am. I mean, I don't know, you know, it's just, but we, we all need rest. And here's the thing. Sometimes you can get eight, ten hours a day of sleep. But if you haven't settled your salvation, I can promise you, you're not going to be rested. There's nothing that gives rest like the peace that comes from knowing Christ as your Savior. And, and so he gives you rest. He gives you, you know, a, a cleansing. He satisfies your thirst. He satisfies your hunger. Uh, Revelation 22 there says the spirit and the bride, both the spirit and the bride say, come, let anyone who hears say, come, let the one who is thirsty come, let one who desires to take the water of life freely. Jesus told the lady at the well there in Samaria, he said, if you will drink from the well that I offer, if you'll give me drink from your, your well, I'll give you drink from my well. And my well, you'll never thirst again. There won't be anything else you need. I mean, he says that he will satisfy our hunger. John 6, 35, he's the bread of life. And he says, anyone who comes to me will, will, you know, the one who comes to me will ever be hungry again. No one who believes me will ever be thirsty again. I mean, he satisfies. I mean, we hunger, we thirst after so much. We hunger and thirst after, after you know, sometimes a certain position or occupation or recognition or a relationship or, or some material thing. We just get fixated on it and we think we've got to have it. And what happens is we get those things or we, we get into that relationship and it doesn't give us still what we need because there's only one who can satisfy. There's only one who will fill that hunger, who will fill that thirst. And here's the best news of all. <laughs> when you sit at his table, he's never going to tell you you've got to leave. He's never going to kick you out. <laughs> Your seat's always there. He tells us in John 6, 37, everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. Never cast out. You see, if you come to Jesus, you never have to worry about, can I live up to what his expectations are? You know, is he going to unadopt me? <laughs> you can't do that. You remember in that culture, adoption was even greater than birth. I mean, if you got adopted, you immediately were elevated to firstborn status. And you could not undo it. It was permanent. It didn't Walmart where you can take them back. I mean, you can't do that. And, and, and he won't do that. You know why? Because look what he paid for you. I mean, he gave his whole life. He gave everything. He went through all that suffering. You think that he's going to let go of you that easily after he paid such a high price? I mean, just think, think about a couple of things maybe in your life that, that you've purchased at some point. If, uh, if you... I mean, I remember years ago, baseball cards were a big thing. Big thing. Back in the 70s and 80s, people were finding their old Mickey Mantle rookie cards and stuff, and, you know, they were, you know, getting a premium price. 
you know, all these cards. And, and, and I mean, I've got, I don't know how many hundreds of baseball cards. I, I thought it would be a good investment back in the 80s. That's what one of my staff members told me. And, and I've got all these factory sets that are still sealed of upper deck cards. I've got the first upper deck factory set. But it's got Ken Griffey Jr.'s rookie card. It was the first card in that box. Never seen it because I never opened it. Because <laughs> I thought I'd make money off of it one day. Well, that, that factory set's worth about 25 cents on the dollar, what I paid for it back in 1990-something. I mean, it's crazy. But I have some cards that aren't worth a nickel. But I then have some cards that are that are priceless to me because it's my uncle's baseball card. And I paid probably more for those his cards than I should have paid, but it was his card. And you know what? When Jesus looked at you, he didn't put a limit on what he was going to pay for you. You were worth so much. He said, I'll give it all. I'll give it all. Now, I can lose a bunch of cards, and I'm not going to worry about them. But you know where I keep my Uncle Ralph's card? It's in the gun safe. <laughs> where I know it's safe. Where it, nothing's going to happen to it. You need to understand something. Jesus doesn't treat you like a cheap baseball card. You are the most prized, most treasured one of all. And he's, he's not going to let you go. He's not going to discard you. So if one of the reasons why you've never, ever maybe surrendered to Christ, you've never come and, and sat at the table of salvation, is because you didn't think he would want you or that he wouldn't keep you or that you couldn't live up to his expectations, realize that you are more, more than he could ever want. He's not going to let you go. That's the Supper of Salvation. Now, here's the good news. If you go to the Supper of Salvation, you automatically get an invitation to the Second Supper. It's the Supper of the Saints. Over in Revelation 19, beginning there in verse 6, I believe, it talks about there how there will be that marriage feast, the marriage of the Lamb. There in verse 7 it says, Let us be glad, rejoice, and give Him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has prepared himself herself and she was given fine linen and then look at verse 9 it says then he said to them right blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the lamb now only those who go to the first supper get to come to this supper you get that because that's why we call it the supper of the saints it's, it's for the bride of christ and, and everybody who's been saved since pentecost and even before pentecost and and those to the rapture will be at the table and we will be the bride of Christ I mean that's what he tells us here I mean it's gonna be a great banquet and here's the thing how long is it gonna last forever forever I've heard some say it's gonna be at least a thousand years <laughs> because of the thousand year reign of Christ it's gonna be you know it's gonna be like a thousand year honeymoon that we're gonna sit and enjoy the fellowship and the presence of our Lord recognizing that we're with him forever but here's the thing you don't get to sit at that table if you don't sit at the first table you gotta do both but there's a final table now this table Nick you don't want to be at you don't want to be at this, this supper you got the supper of salvation the supper of saints then you got the supper of the suffering of suffering if you keep reading there in Revelation 19 verse 17 what it's describing there is the final battle that will take place between good and evil it's what we call the battle of Armageddon some of you have been to Israel some of you have seen the pictures of, of the valley of Esdraelon it's also known as the valley of Megiddo the reason why they call it Megiddo valley of Megiddo is because there was a city there that was positioned in the valley that was called Megiddo. That's where Solomon kept all of his, many of his chariots and horses. 
and, and it was strategic because it sort of pr protected the valley. You had to pass by that, that city on the major trail going to the coast or even one going to the south. It was an intersection, and there's been more battles took place in, in the old days there than anywhere else. And the Bible tells us that the day is coming when the armies from the east and the armies from the north as well as the armies from the south will converge onto Israel. And that final battle, the epic center of that battle, is going to be this 20-mile wide, 20-mile long valley. And what's going to happen, as the Scripture says there, that the sword will come from the mouth of the one who sits on the horse. You know who that is? That's Jesus. I mean, all the armies are coming against, you know, the people of God there. And, and Jesus is going to just break through the sky, and what's he going to do? Boom. He's just going to say the word. No sword comes out that just sort of decapitates everyone. I don't believe it's going to be like it. I think he just says the word. And I don't mean to make this gory, but somehow they just start rupturing and bleeding out. Because the Bible says the blood is going to flow the height of a horse's bridle, bridle which is about like that, in a 20 by 20 square mile valley. But if you read the scripture and prophecy, it's not just in that valley, but that blood will flow all the way down to Jerusalem and beyond. That's how many people are going to die in that battle. And who's going to die? Those that have rejected Christ. Those who were deceived, who took the mark of the beast. Those who followed the devil instead of following Jesus. Wow. You see, instead of being the guest, those are going to be the feast. The people who attend this supper are going to be the meal. Because what does it say there? It says that all the flesh-eating birds will have their fill of eating the flesh of those who die that day. And so friend, let me tell you, if you don't come to the table and dine on the supper of salvation, you will be at the supper of suffering. You say, what if I'm not alive then? Well, I can promise you, you're already going to be suffering way, way more. Because it's not just going to be a physical death that you experience there in the Valley of Israel, it's eternal death. It's eternal death. And that's what happens when you don't know Christ. This is one time it's okay to miss a meal. Two out of three is the way you, way you want to go here. Two out of three. Because here's the good news. The second one, like I said, will last forever. That's what he promises us. And that's what he offers us. Jesus, to help them understand the supper of salvation he took the Passover and he changed it up he talked about how it was a foreshadow of what he was getting ready to do in the next 24 hours as he would go to the cross for you and me and he introduced it not just I think to help them try one more time to give them a, a picture of what was getting ready to happen but I, I think he gave it to them as a, for several reasons. I think one was it was to remind them of the, the seriousness of what was about to happen. And not just the seriousness, but also to remind them it's, it's important that they're ready, that they're ready to go out from that place when this major change was coming through the cross. And this table, every time we come to it, it ought to be a time where we, as, as Paul tells us in Corinthians, there in talking about this supper, he says we need to examine ourselves. We need to look carefully and make sure that we are in good standing with our Lord. He said, well, what does that mean? Because I thought he accepted me completely and without reservation. He absolutely does. But the one thing that we're told is that we should never come to this table and take the bread and the cup if we know that we have sin in our life and we're not willing to deal with that sin. But we choose to hang on to that sin. Because what we're doing is when we come and we take the cup and the bread and we're choosing to 
hang on to that sin and not repent of it choose to get rid of it out of our life we're saying you know what I know you died for that Lord but you know what I think my sin is more important to me than what you did on the cross that's why he says it's like drinking condemnation to yourself because you're taking lightly what Jesus did and he says we should never do that and so I, I hope that you'll take time today to not just take comfort in what Jesus did but also to to have some conviction about what Jesus did and that you will allow yourselves to really think and ask the Holy Spirit to show you anything you need to take care of maybe you're cross with somebody maybe there's a you got a you know you're got an issue with somebody We'll take care of that before you take the Lord's Supper. You say, well, I'll go to them later. Well, the Bible says you need, it says sometimes you need to leave the altar and go right to them then. And you know what? I've been in services where we've had revival break out because we were getting ready to take the Lord's Supper. And I, all of a sudden, I see somebody get up in the room and they walk across or maybe walk down a few rows and put their arm around somebody. And next thing I know, I hear sniffles and hugging and weeping and, and God just did a work of reconciliation. See, that's what church is. It's a place to heal. It's a place for a fresh start. And every time we come to this table, it reminds us that it's not just the first day of the week, but it's the opportunity to begin fresh for a fresh start. So would you pray with me as we prepare and as our men come forward to assist? And Lord, as we now enter this time of examination, I pray that we will take seriously what you've done. And to be honest, maybe the most spiritual thing we can do is if there is something or someone that's hindering our, our relationship with you right now, that we let the tray pass. It doesn't mean that that we're the most horrible person in the world it may mean that we're the most spiritual person in this room because we're taking seriously what you've said. And Lord, we want to deal with that issue before we proceed any further. So Lord, I pray that you would make it very, very clear. But Lord, I thank you that you were willing to go the, to the ultimate mile for us that there was no reservation no hesitation in what you had purpose to do even before you created this world the Bible says that you were in essence spiritually slain because you had already agreed to go to the cross for us so Lord as we come to your table today we pray that you will that you will make it fresh in our memory that this will be a fresh reminder of of what we have in you and give us confidence to, to live in a way that brings you glory and honor. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 
scripture tells us that on the night of the Passover, that which we just spent time talking about, that once they had finished the normal meal, they then Jesus took the bread that was on the table and said, this bread takes on you meaning tonight as it represents my body. He offered up a prayer of blessing for the bread. I'll ask Brother Charlie if you would uh, pray for our bread today and what it represents. A gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you during this solemn time, we just ask you, Lord, to uh, bless our time together. We thank you for this food that you have given us through this uh, bread that we're taking that represents the body of Jesus Christ who died on that cross for our sins. His body was broken for the transgressions that we committed uh, and that we are, will continue to commit, Father. So we just pray, Lord, that you would help us to live in a spirit of thankfulness throughout our lives as we remember all that you have done for us and help us to share that good news with others so that they too might experience the forgiveness that we have because of your body which was broken for us. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Take heed. This represents his body which is broken for you.
scripture goes on and tells us that in the same way, just as they took the bread, Jesus took the cup that was on the table. Now, remember at Passover, there's three cups that they took sequentially at different times in the, in the observance of the Passover. And when they got to the final cup that night, Jesus said, it's going to take on you, meaning. Well, this cup represents a commitment that he made with his father, his father with him, that he would come into this world and he would give his own life so that we could be forgiven. And not just forgiveness, but have life as well. The Red Cross got it right when it says, when you give blood, you give the gift of life. But more than just physical life, the blood of Jesus gives us eternal life, spiritual life. And before they took the cup, they offered up a prayer of thanks. And I'm going to ask Brother Brian, if he would, to give thanks for the cup today. Father, we're so honored to just to be here in your house, Father, just to be able to worship you, the privilege to worship you. Father, just remind you this morning during worship as John uh, worshiped you with the song that you touched each and every one of us and you made us whole. It reminds me of the woman that had been bleeding for a number of years and was just trying to go through the crowd uh, just, to, just to touch his garment. And Father, not, you only didn't make her an inhaler from that um, element, but Father, you made her whole. And Father, this is what your blood does. Father, as another song that John sang this morning, Father, is that you wash us in your blood to make us whole, to make us pure, to make us holy in your image. So, Father, we just thank you uh, that your blood covers all of our sin, our iniquity, our transgressions. Father, is, and we, just, we just can't thank you enough. And, Father, just the remembrance of, of what this cup means and, and what uh, your blood was shed for us. So, Father, we give you thanks. Father, that many of us may uh, go to bed at night weeping, but your word reminds us that joy comes in the morning because of your blood. So, Father God, we just thank you again for this cup. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And as he reminded us, drink this cup in remembrance of him. As you leave, there should be some trash cans along the aisles that you can just deposit that in. But Brother John is going to come and close us in a song and as they leave that song you'll consider that your benediction if you're a first time guest though we would love for you to come over here and uh, Janice will be there to greet you we've got a gift we would love to give you as our guest help you get to know a little bit more about who we are well, let's stand and as John leads you can go ahead and begin making your way to your small groups for fellowship and Bible study I'm not sure if that's on, but we're going to play it loud. <laughs> okay, everybody sing with me. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and He walks with me, and He talks with me, and He tells me I am His own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known.
you're not getting any signal up there at all? Maybe she needs to go back. She just changed that battery. 